House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who professes to be a practicing Catholic, is now being barred from communion in at least four dioceses. Just a week after the Archbishop of San Francisco denied her communion over her avid support of abortion, which runs counter uh, to the Bible and Catholic teaching. And now more Roman Catholic bishops are stepping out in support of the decision. Now, Speaker Pelosi, in response, has defended her abortion stance and criticized the church for not taking action on Catholics who support the death penalty. Now, this has attracted the attention of, uh, of a lot of people, including, um, I'm not sure how I would define her, Whoopi Goldberg. I, I, I don't know what she is, but... Um, I mean, she has a TV program. Uh, I wouldn't call her a celebrity. I would call her, well, she's just off her rocker is what I would say. But this is what she had to say about uh, the archbishop's decision. This is not your job, dude. <laughs> that is not, you can't, that is not up to you to make that decision. It's not your job, dude. It's not the job of a priest to exercise church discipline. So, wow, I, th there's so much there. Joining me now to talk about this and uh, more related to this decision is David Clawson, FRC's director of our Center for Biblical Worldview. David, welcome back to the program. Yeah, great to be with you, Tony. Um, you know, I don't even know <laughs> where to start with that, but is this archbishop not exercising the type of church discipline that Paul... Uh, wrote about, uh, for, in one example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is, Tony. I think faithful Catholics, as well as non-Catholics, I'm a Southern Baptist, uh, but I'm really grateful for the Archbishop of San Francisco to take this action, because this is exactly his job. Uh, the job of an archbishop or of a pastor or of a priest, anyone in church authority, is, is twofold, really, Tony. One is to offer pastoral care to their members, and two is to defend uh, church doctrine. And this is exactly what the archbishop uh, did in San Francisco. One, uh, and he made this very clear in a public letter that he wrote uh, to Speaker Pelosi. He said, after trying to contact her six times privately, he said, my hand was kind of forced. I, I had to bar you from receiving uh, communion because I'm concerned about the state of your soul, and I know I'm going to have to give an account for the state of your soul. And, and Roman Catholic theology, Tony, uh, that's the role of an archbishop or a priest. They're responsible uh, for the, those that are in their diocese. And so, one, he, he's concerned about the state of her soul, and he, and he tells her that in a very uh, kind and pastoral way. Uh, but then the other role of a church leader is to defend church doctrine. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, has been clear on where they stand on the life issue for 2,000 years. So, Tony, in response to Whoopi Goldberg, uh, this archbishop is doing exactly what he should be doing. And also, if you, if you if a, as a pastor, as a priest, you don't address these issues that are antithetical to Scripture, and, and you allow a, a high-profile person to do it, then they will interpret that as, it's not a big deal, it's okay, I can do the same thing or hold the same position. No, that's absolutely right. And actually, what our, the Archbishop did that's really helpful, he actually called the Speaker's insistence on being so pro-abortion as a scandal. Now, in Roman, Catholic, in Roman Catholicism, in their theology, that word scandal means something. And what it means is this, this is not only uh, putting her soul in grave danger, uh, those who see her example, it's putting them in danger too, because looking at someone who's uh, outspoken as a Catholic, they, other Catholics might think, oh, well, if, if Nancy Pelosi can receive communion and be a, a member of good standing, then maybe the church isn't that serious on the issue of abortion. So in these letters that the archbishop wrote to Speaker Pelosi, to other members of his diocese, and he wrote another letter to the priest that he oversees, he said what Pelosi is doing is a scandal. It's not good for her soul, and it's not good for the souls of other Catholics. And so again, he's being very clear. All right, so now that I've brought that up, and I think most of our listeners would probably agree, I, I want to go to an area that uh, may be controversial. I actually talked about this uh, last week when I had Dr. Moeller on the program talking about the scandal, if you will, in the Southern Baptist Convention. But I, but I want to first, I, I want to read, I made reference to this, but I want to read just a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Uh, this was Paul talking about immorality in the church. Body has to be dealt with. And this was an incestuous relationship. It was a sexual relationship would tend to be, you know, very prevalent. Usually it, sur- it uh, surrounds money or uh, sex is usually what brings down uh, people. Uh, chapter 5, verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? So, you know, he says, I'm not worried about what's happening outside the church, but those who would claim membership... I have, uh, you have, he says to the local church, you have a duty to break fellowship with him when they're unrepentant. And so I, I made this point with Dr. Moeller last week, and I, I think it is absolutely at the heart of the problem that we see not just in the Catholic Church with the scandals that they had. I see it within the Baptist Church, the Protestant Church, the broader evangelical church is the lack of church discipline that we don't confront these things because uh, we're, we're conflict-adverse. Uh, we want people inside. You know, we want, we want more people to come into the church, but we don't want to disciple them, and discipleship sometimes requires discipline. It does, Tony, and, and you know, speaking as a Southern Baptist uh, who's been a member of a Southern Baptist church since I was dedicated as an infant, the 31 years in Southern Baptist churches, I didn't actually see uh, church discipline and excommunication happen until I was 30 years old, uh, until just last year at my church here, uh, Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and I think that I talked to my friends who uh, about you know who are involved in other churches. Uh, they've never seen a church uh, enact discipline on a member. And I think you're absolutely right. Too many pastors are scared to death of offending people, and we're not taking seriously enough what God's word says. And that gets back to what you and I have talked about a lot: the need for pastors to be discipling their people. And, you know, it's not a huge surprise. Last week, George Barnum was on the show, and he said, you know, only 51% of evangelical pastors have a biblical worldview. And so I'm actually not that surprised that we see so few instances of church discipline, because even our, a lot of our pastors are not thinking biblically through every issue that we deal with. And see, what that is, having a biblical worldview, and fortunately about three-quarters of Southern Baptist pastors have a biblical worldview— mm-hmm is that you are looking at these things through the lenses of Scripture. And the Bible gives us clarity on exactly what we do. I've been involved in two cases of uh, issues that needed to be addressed in terms of church discipline. One of them happened to be a pastor that I was a part of having to, to confront over this. But we followed the biblical model. There is biblical guidance. I think part of the challenge is we're influenced by the culture, we're in, in, in the culture, in part, is the legal system. We're afraid of uh, being sued or, or some other legal action when the Bible must be preeminent in the way we conduct business. And I go back to Whoopi, Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg's uh, comments, because I, I did that not just because I think she's crazy, but because I think it makes a point. If the church... The church is criticized, the Southern Baptists criticized justifiably so for what uh, was announced last week. But had they been practicing church discipline, which the Catholic archbishop was doing and was criticized by the culture for doing, I mean, we need to, to quit listening to the critics and do what the Word of God says. And that means those within the, the, the walls of the church, those that are a part of the membership, you know, part of that is it, it, it's... I, Somehow people think discipline is a, um, is a negative thing. It is a positive thing that can enrich our lives by helping us see the blind spots that we're not seeing and make a course correction so that we might enjoy the blessings of God. Yeah, you're right. And again, it's, we talk about a biblical worldview uh, quite often. That's, uh, last week was our one-year anniversary for our Center for Biblical Worldview. It's important to everything we do at FRC. But you're right, Tony. The Bible gives us blueprints for all of these things. Matthew 18 right. uh, on how to reconcile that's how differences. We, that's, how we, that's what uh, we follow. First Corinthians chapter 5, which you just mentioned at the top of this segment. Uh, the Bible lays out, and, and the purpose of church discipline is not to make someone feel ostracized or make them feel bad. It's actually to draw them back. 
Uh, one exactly. of the neatest things I've ever experienced, Tony, again, I've seen a couple of instances of church discipline, was someone who we excommunicated for an immoral lifestyle, and several months later they came back and repented, and they, one of the things that got their attention was the fact that someone had told them they were living out of step right. with the gospel. And see, if you ignore that, which has been the tendency, then not only does that individual think it's okay, but others take their cues from that as, as well. And, and that's what the archbishop and another denomination, the Catholic Church, was getting at. One of the reasons he felt obligated, he felt like he had to write this public letter to Speaker Pelosi, is because of all of these other Catholics who are looking at what she's doing and think, well, if the Speaker is able to do this and she considers herself devout, um, and, and faithful, then it must the, the church must not take this issue that seriously. And the archbishop said he's fearing for her soul, he's fearing for his own soul and other souls. So again, I'm not a Catholic, but uh, praise God that he's giving us an example of what a church leader ought to do when someone in their care is going wayward. And, and this is a very, very uh, politicized issue, abortion. Um, I mean, he's been roundly criticized. I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've read some. I'm sure personally he's experienced some of this. But for him, th this was not, for these bishops, not just the archbishop, th 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 this, these are not political issues. These are moral and they're spiritual issues. And I, I, we say this all the time, and I'll say it again to pastors, to Christians, to churches. These issues are first and foremost spiritual. There's, there's nothing that happens in this city, in Washington, D.C., that is not under the purview or concern of God. And we need not shrink back or hesitate to speak truth into these arenas just because someone has planted a flag and declared it political. You're absolutely right. And there are just some issues, Tony, that we've talked about that, you know, the Bible doesn't give exact principles on every single issue, but there are some issues that there's a thus saith the Lord on the issue of the definition of marriage, on the, the sacredness and personhood of the unborn. There's a chapter and verse that we can point to. And that's why, again, we, we can't shrink back. If, if we shrink back, if we give that up, then we don't even have a Christianity that we can recognize anymore. And so we, we got to be clear. And, and while I'm on this, uh, this path, let me go just a little bit further. When we talk about church discipline, which I think is critical, and I, I think parents also need to be affirmed and empowered to disciple and discipline their children. There, there are many parents that are afraid. They're literally afraid. I've talked to them. I know this is real. I'm not making this up. They're afraid because... The, the child might say something to a teacher, and social services might show up at the door. And now this is only being magnified when you have an administration that is encouraging teachers and administrators not to tell parents about you know, uh, issues regarding their gender and sexuality to, to be discussed. So parents, it's like they're handcuffed. And I'm a Christian parent, you have been given a child, and you've been given the authority and the responsibility to raise that child, and you need to exercise biblical discipleship and discipline in the home. No, absolutely. When we look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, Tony, I think, you know, a biblical worldview, this is a biblical worldview covers all issues that we deal with, whether it's the issues that you and I deal with on a daily basis, like religious freedom and abortion, but education, discipling, catechizing your children. Uh, the Bible literally gives us a template for how to do this, that is the parents' responsibility to see themselves as the chief disciple makers in their home. And, and it's, I love Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it's, when you're sitting down, when you're walking in the way, when you're lying down, when you're rising up, there's nothing yep. not covered. And, and so, you know, I was just, I think about that often because especially with my, uh, my young son, my youngest son, who, uh, who now hangs out with dad because the others are kind of uh, older, uh, we, we have conversations about everything and we apply the scripture. You know, we, we will have a discussion about any topic that seems to pop up and we say, well, well I'll ask him those questions. What, what does the word of God have to say about that? And helping him to understand that from a biblical uh, perspective. Yeah, and there's so many issues that just come up in normal conversation. I think a lot of parents that sometimes I talk to think, oh, this whole discipling and biblical worldview inculcation sounds kind of academic and intellectual. It's, it's not really. No. It's just talking about the issues you would normally talk about, but being intentional about pointing to the Bible. We're almost out of time, so you have some resources available to help parents in those conversations. We do. They're at frc.org slash worldview. And in the, in the next couple of months, Tony, we're hoping to release more resources, even a curriculum 
uh, to help parents and pastors address the issues we've talked about just now and others all through the lens of Scripture. So frc.org slash worldview. All right, David Clawson, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for uh, dropping by the studio today. Thank you, Tony. All right.